Hello everyone. Welcome back. This is a donated request from um, Yasin Muhammad. This is uh, Musab Ib. I want to say Umar, Umair, Umair. So is it Musab Ib Umair? Musab, Musab Ib Umair. If I'm wrong, he's got to change his name then. Because I can't be wrong. Except the times when I usually am. Okay. This is the the first. This is the man who gave it all. Uh, Dr. Omar. I'm liking him the more I see his videos. But I like the, this series too, the first. I really do dig them. Or enjoy them. However you like to say it. Before we get started... There is a thanks button. You can donate, subscribe if you'd like, and thumbs up at bare minimum. These will either be a little over 15 minutes, and there will be five of them, or I'll go about 19 minutes, and there will be four of them. We'll see. Depends on, um, depends on my dogs, really. So, inshallah ta'ala, uh, tonight we are on episode 50 of the first. So, first and foremost, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to benefit from what we have learned about these blessed companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and to emulate what we have learned of them and to apply that in our lives. And we ask Allah to join us with them and with our beloved Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in al-Firdaus al-A'la. Ameen Ya Rabbil Alameen. Now with that being said, inshallah ta'ala, a few things before I get started. This is the last long episode we're going to do in season one of the first. So let me explain what that means. This is the last Tuesday night that we're going to have a live session for a few months inshallah ta'ala. And we will wrap up the first season of As-Sabiqun al-Awaloon of the first. Why? Because what I want to do for the next few months, inshallah ta'ala, is I want to extract some of the biographies from these books of seer that are not spoken about at all in the Muslim memory. Names like Khunais, uh, you know, and Ashifa shifa and Atika, and, uh, you know, uh, Rukasha, and Mihja, names that are not familiar, radiallahu anhum ajma'in, that are not familiar to Muslims. And one of my main intentions for this series was to bring out some of those early Muslims that we often don't hear about. So what we're going to be doing, these are people that if you read, you know, uh, Al-Isaba by Ibn Hajar, or the Tabaqat of Ibn Sa'id, or Sirah Adam al Nubula, you'll find one or two paragraphs about them. But I want us to know their names, inshallah ta'ala, to know something about them. So every week, you'll find online, inshallah ta'ala, on uh, our YouTube channel, Yaqeen Institute, a new biography that's uploaded. These episodes will be about 15 minutes on average, inshallah ta'ala reflecting on some of these names. Then what we will do inshallah ta'ala is we'll get back to the in-person long lectures inshallah, long biographies, and we'll start with the Ansar of the Prophet sallallahu in season two. Who are we talking about tonight? We're talking about Mus'ab ibn Umair radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Mus'ab radiallahu anhu is literally the bridge between as-sabiqun al-awwalun, the muhajirun and the Ansar. He's the bridge between the first in Mecca and the first in Medina. And so it's fitting that we saved him for the last of the long biographies inshallah ta'ala that we are covering in this series so that we can understand the way that the baton was passed from Mecca to Medina and bi'idnillahi ta'ala by the time we start season two inshallah ta'ala of the first uh, you would have had an appreciation of pretty much all of the names in some capacity men and women that accepted Islam early on with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in those first 13 years so we start with Mus'ab ibn Umair radiallahu ta'ala anhu by far subhanallah one of my favorite biographies in the seer in the biographies of the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam truly an extraordinary human being and you could dwell on every part of his Islam and spend an entire class on it because everything about him is against the norms subhanallah what he was able to accomplish and what he represented Mus'ab radiallahu ta'ala anhu goes against every single wind, every trend to embrace Islam and to become one of its greatest 
carriers. Some call him the first Safir, the first ambassador of Islam, Mus'ab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who fits many categories. There's a beautiful narration from Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu, where he says, Inna kulla nabiyin u'tiya sab'ata nujuba aw nuqaba. He said that every Nabi, every Prophet was given seven special servants or, or, or special um, attendants, not servants. Uh, a better word is like your disciples. But Hawari is disciples, and the Prophet Sallallahu disciple was who? As Zubayr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, right? That's who he called his Hawari, his disciple. But they're special followers, they're guards, they are always there around that Prophet of Allah. So the Prophet Sallallahu is saying that every Prophet had seven of these people, and he said, وَأُعْطِيتُ أَنَا أَرْبَعَةَ عَشَرَ And I was given 14. قُلْنَا مَنْ هُمْ We said, who are they? And some of the scholars say this narration is actually Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu speaking, uh, not the Prophet sallallahu himself. So that's why the narration comes across as such. أَنَا وَأَبْنَيْ Me and my two sons, that is Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and his two sons, Al-Hassan wal Hussein, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with them. So the first three that are mentioned here, Ali, wal Hassan wal Hussein, may Allah be pleased with them. And we covered them, of course, early on in this series. Wa Ja'far, wa Hamza, wa Abu Bakr, wa Umar. Ja'far, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Hamza, radiallahu anhu. The two shaykhs of this ummah, Abu Bakr and Umar, radiallahu anhuma. Wa Mus'ab, wa Bilal, wa Salman. And Mus'ab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and Bilal and Salman. Wa Ammar wal Miqdad, and Ammar ibn Yasir, and al Miqdad, may Allah be pleased with them. All of them we have covered. Wa Hudayfa wa Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, and Hudayfa uh, and Abdullah, uh, Abu Dhar, I'm sorry, wa Hudayfa uh, and Abu Dhar, wa Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. Hudayfa, Abu Dhar, and Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. So these are the 14 special attendants to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that are mentioned here. And of course, there are various narrations that mention the companions and their special virtues. The only person we haven't covered out of all of this is the one we are covering tonight, which is Mus'ab ibn Umair radiallahu ta'ala anhu. His full name is Mus'ab ibn Umair ibn Hashim ibn Abdi Manaf. Uh, he is from a small tribe in Quraysh known as Banu Abdari. Banu Abdari, and if you notice when you look at the tribes of Quraysh, one way to understand the way that the tribes worked is that the bigger tribes had a, you know, a disproportionate amount of power and influence amongst Quraysh. The bigger tribes tended to have power. Some of those smaller tribes of Quraysh that had a high lineage but they were small in numbers tended to have a huge accumulation of wealth. So there's wealth with some of the small tribes and a lot of power with some of the large tribes. And of course, all of them had their pride, their boasting in their nasab, in their lineage, which was prominent in the time. So Mus'ab radiallahu ta'ala anhu comes from one of the richest and smallest tribes of Quraysh, Banu Abdari, and he in particular will be the richest amongst them. So I want to give you a profile of Mus'ab radiallahu ta'ala anhu before we start talking about his Islam so you can understand it. If you saw Mus'ab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, you would say this is the most handsome man that I've ever seen in my life. He was an extremely handsome man. He resembled the Prophet so much so that in Uhud, they could mistake the Prophet and Mus'ab. That's how close he looked to the Prophet and we know the beauty of our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So Mus'ab radiallahu ta'ala anhu was a beautiful, handsome man. He had a beautiful smile radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He was extremely wealthy. And here's how he became so wealthy. He was the only child of his mother. His mother's name was Khunas bint Malik. Khunas bint Malik. His father was Umair. Now just so you understand this for a bit, he was the only child of Khunas bint Malik. So he's the only child of Khunas bint Malik. However, he has two brothers from his father, half-brothers from Umair. One of them is a man by the name of Mansur ibn Umair radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And by the way, he's one of those who also became Muslim early on, migrated to Abyssinia, migrated to Al-Madinah, uh, participated in Badr and Uhud, and died as a shaheed in Yarmouk radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So that's the half-brother of Mus'ab ibn Umair, Mansur ibn Umair radiallahu ta'ala anhu. His second brother is named Abu Yazid ibn Umair. And he also, radiallahu anhu, became Muslim, but he became Muslim at the time of the Fatih, at the time of the conquest. So much, much later on, and there's a famous story 
of him as a prisoner in Badr, fighting against the Muslims that we'll talk about. So these are Mus'ab radiallahu anhu's two half-brothers from his father. From his mother, he was the only child, okay? His father, extremely wealthy. And when he passed away, Mus'ab radiallahu anhu ended up with the largest share of his wealth. He inherits a ton of wealth. How wealthy was he? Listen to this, this is, this is pretty significant. They said that if you took what Mus'ab radiallahu anhu inherited from his father, who died when he was a child, and you compared it to the wealth of all of Mecca, Mus'ab radiallahu anhu alone, his wealth was about half of that. The wealth that Mus'ab grew up in, <laughs> not earned, grew up in, was about half of the wealth of the people of Mecca altogether. On top of that, he is his mother's only child. His mother adores him. Her whole life surrounds Mus'ab. She doesn't remarry. She has no other children. Her entire life is about Mus'ab. She spoils him rotten, and that's not an exaggeration. I mean spoils him with all of the luxury that he already inherited, as well as the luxury that she had as well. So what does she do? From, from the time he's a little child, Mus'ab radiallahu anhu is wearing you know, all types of gold. And of course back then, none of this is haram and jahili in the days of ignorance. Mus'ab had the gold bracelets on him, he had the gold chains. Mus'ab radiallahu ta'ala anhu is wearing sins as a child. You know when you see the rich children that, you know, that, that are dressed in clothes that you would never afford as an adult? That's Mus'ab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that child, right? Even as a baby, He's dressed in these clothes. He has the best perfumes in Mecca. She basically told him, you're gonna look like a rapper in, in the 2000s. And he was like, what? And she's like, just go with it. All the gold, <laughs> all the, the silk. <laughs> he probably had fake gold teeth too, right? <laughs> he has only custom clothes, a tailor, a special tailor that comes from Yemen that tailors his clothes for him the best of clothes, the best of silks, the best of jewelry, the best of perfumes, and on top of that, by the way, he said even his shoes were tailored. All right, customized shoes from Mus'ab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and when Mus'ab grows up as a teenager, he goes right into the role. Handsome, has the best perfume, the best shoes, the best clothes. Basically, Mus'ab radiallahu anhu, what he wore was the trend in Mecca. And they would dilute the perfume to smell close to the perfume of Mus'ab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So what Mus'ab could afford in terms of perfume would stay in a place for days. They knew that he was there uh, three days, four days after he was there because of the type of perfume that he wore. They would dilute their perfumes in Mecca to try to smell like his, and that was, that was the branding of it, the selling of it, right? So everyone wanted to be like him. Everyone wanted to look like him. Everyone wanted to dress like him. Everyone wanted to smell like him. That's a lot for the ego of a child, right? That's a lot that could go to a young person's head. On top of that, his mother is making him the king of the world. He has good looks. He's very intelligent. He, everyone wants to be around him, friends. All that is there, right? So he's growing up in this type of environment. And that would be probably the least likely you know, young person to accept Islam, right? A lot, of, a lot of young people don't have their coming to Allah moment until what? until that dream gets shattered quickly. You think that pursuing a certain type of social life is going to make you happy, and then once you realize that's not really working out for you as a young person, then you start to think about religion. Let me get through my youth, my silliness, especially if I have a lot of money that I inherited, which usually translates into recklessness, and then I'll think about religion. Mus'ab radiallahu ta'ala anhu has nothing shattering his image for him. It is all perfectly in place for him, until he hears about Dar al-Arqam. He hears because Mus'ab radiallahu ta'ala anhu is surrounded by people, people tell him things, so he gets news early on, because everyone's always coming to him, to ask him questions, to talk to him, to be around him. He hears about Dar al-Arqam, this place where Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is gathering 10, 15, 20 companions in the house of al-Arqam, who's also a teenager, Mus'ab radiallahu anhu was only a young boy, barely a teenager at this point, and he's talking to them about this new religion, monotheism, the hereafter, things that he had never heard of. Mus'ab radiallahu ta'ala anhu is curious. Now Mus'ab, and this is when the Prophet ﷺ says that people are like precious stones. Khiyarakum fil jahriya, khiyarakum fil islam. The best of you in the days of ignorance are the best of you in Islam. Even though Mus'ab radiallahu anhu had all this, he wasn't pompous. 
He didn't, you don't find any instance in Jahliya of Mus'ab radiallahu anhu, you know, slapping a slave or spitting on someone or belittling someone or denigrating something, which is a testimony to his character early on. He's pompous, he's growing up in luxury. If there was a reality TV show at the time, it would have all been about uh, Mus'ab radiallahu anhu, right? But he's not arrogant in the sense he doesn't denigrate people. He says, I'm very curious about this. But he wants to go very secretively to Dar al-Arqam because he doesn't want his mom to find out. Ultimately, all of this comes from his mother. So the description of him, subhanAllah, going to Dar al-Arqam is that he literally went in the, in the depths of the night and he's, he's tippy-toeing, he's, he's going so quietly to Dar al-Arqam trying to escape the crowds, the sight of people to see what's going on. And he knocks extremely softly on the door and they let him in. When they let him in, Rasulullah was teaching, he was addressing them. So he, he, he interrupted in a way, or he, walk, he happened to walk in when the Prophet was talking to them. So put yourself through the lens of Mus'ab radiallahu anhu, opening the door of Dar al-Arqam, you see all of these people. Who are the majority of the people sitting around the Prophet The exact opposite of you from a societal standpoint. Slaves, poor people, oppressed people, people without tribe. That's pretty much who's gathered around the Prophet so when they see Mus'ab radiallahu anhu, there is a, a mood in the room, like who just walked in the room. But Mus'ab is not like Umar radiallahu anhu where when he knocks everyone's like, okay, let's, let's get ready. Mus'ab radiallahu anhu is not a threat, but it's what's he doing here? Right, wow, he's here? Well, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam notices him, but the Prophet Sallallahu doesn't stop talking. He continues to speak and he happened to be speaking about Al-Jannah wa nar paradise and hellfire, and the notions of the hereafter. And as he is speaking, Mus'ab radiallahu ta'ala anhu waits and he asks the Prophet sallallahu a few questions and Mus'ab radiallahu ta'ala anhu embraces Islam in that moment. First encounter with the Prophet sallallahu in Dar al-Arqam. This is a huge development in Mecca, but Mus'ab radiallahu ta'ala anhu is in big trouble if he gets caught. So the Prophet ﷺ tells Mus'ab radiallahu ta'ala anhu to keep his Islam private as the companions at that point were not announcing their Islam. So Mus'ab radiallahu anhu kept his Islam private. However, he became a student of the Prophet ﷺ in Dar al-Arqam. So he became a regular attendee of Dar al-Arqam along with those denigrated people in society, sitting with them, learning from the Prophet ﷺ, being mentored by the Prophet ﷺ developing his akhlaq, and sometimes Mus'ab radiallahu ta'ala anhu would secretly go and pray around the Kaaba, or he'd pray with the Prophet sallallahu and some of the companions. At that time, it's not the five salawat, it's not the five prayers, but they still had some iteration of prayer. They prayed Qiyamul layl they prayed the night prayer, so he's hiding his Islam for, from his mom for a while. Then one day, he gets caught. The man who catches him is a man by the name of Uthman ibn Talha radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Uthman ibn Talha uh, is famous for being the, the person who the Prophet ﷺ gave the keys to the Kaaba in Fatih Mecca and said that the keys stay with your tribe. So Uthman ibn Talha is a noble man, but he did not become Muslim also until right before Fatih Mecca, until right before the conquest of Mecca, around the time of Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So at this point, Uthman ibn Talha is one of those that are hostile to the Prophet ﷺ and his message. Uthman ibn Talha sees Mus'ab radiallahu ta'ala anhu praying secretly around the Kaaba. Who does he go to? He goes to his mother. His mother is in complete disbelief. Do you know what your son has done? She says, what? He joined the, the ranks of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa She says, no, not my son, no way. This has to be a misunderstanding. There's no way my son Mus'ab is so close to his mother, they talk all the time, there's a great level of love and obedience and good character. My son would have told me if he became Muslim, of course he didn't join the religion of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So they bring Mus'ab forward and they bring some of the uncles of Mus'ab from Banu Abdari and they ask him directly, is it true that you have left your religion and joined the religion of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? And Mus'ab radiallahu ta'ala anhu does not lie, he admits it, he says it's true. Shock, how do we contain this? Now with Mus'ab, there's something very sensitive about this. If you beat him publicly, Mus'ab is a trendsetter, right? So Mus'ab radiallahu anhu was followed in so many different trends, could easily become a trendsetter for Islam as well, and they know it. 
So they have to keep this. Well, it, it's good that they weren't saying, well, if he's a trendsetter. So if he gets a black eye, everyone's going to want a black eye. No, not that. We don't want, we don't want to set that trend. That's, you know. <laughs> very, very, very quiet. His mother was so upset. She goes up to him. She, she spoiled him. She absolutely loves him. She thinks that there is this communication that's 100% back and forth. So she has to feel like she did something wrong or what has she done to make him not trust her? Or, you know, I, I, I can understand what she would be thinking, you know, but at the same time, your child has to be able to have some autonomy to, to explore things. And I understand that becoming Muslim back then, much different than today. I get that. And so I can understand why it would be looked negatively upon. But at the same time, the more you try to control your kid, the more you're going to end up pushing them away. And yeah, she's in a tough spot, but at the same time, you you don't have control of that kid forever. I and I, I can say that now it's probably I mean, it's vastly different, but yeah, I do feel bad for her. And subhanAllah, this is this shows you the very human emotions that are at play here. She's about to hit him, but she can't. She loves him too much. Never hit her son before. She doesn't know how to hit him. So she holds herself back. She's screaming at him. She can't hit him, which was very common at that time. And she said, you know what? I'm going to imprison you. Basically, I'm going to keep you tied up in the house. You will not leave this house until you renounce this religion of yours. So he was tied up in a corner of the home, sort of in a dungeon and deprived and you know everything is taken away from him he's not able to see the light of day but at the same time she did not beat him she would not hit him so Mus'ab radiallahu ta'ala anhu is in this basically the situation of solitary confinement he has no brothers around him he has no sisters around him he has no spouse he has no friends no one to actually come to him and he is waiting for his mother to relent and let him out. So his mother, still being compassionate towards him, checks on him and tries to talk to him, tries to convince him to leave Islam. Mus'ab radiallahu ta'ala anhu is unrelenting. Mus'ab in turn invites her to Islam and she mocks the idea altogether. And she continues to make the deprivation of food and drink and things of that sort worse for him, hoping that that will be enough to cause Mus'ab radiallahu ta'ala anhu to relent. However, Mus'ab I'm gonna go back. Um, yeah, I'm gonna stop it there. Yeah, that, I don't know if if I would go as far as now locking my child up, but I I understand. Learning more and more, I I really do understand as a parent. I'm not a parent, but as a parent would be back then, how your child, your cousin, nephew, niece you know, whatever, brother, how, how the tribes worked and how condemned Muhammad was when he kind of came forward, you know, not by everyone clearly, but I, I can understand. And to be honest, I could say that if I was back in that time, I would probably be, probably be one of the people who would be you know, oh, he doesn't, that Muhammad, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Oh, yeah, he's a prophet. I would be one of those people. I, I know I would be. I'm positive I'd be one of those people. Because, oh, sure he was. I would instantly, no. That guy's. But at the same time, I can also look back on it now and say, but he, he was an honest guy. Everyone said he was honest. He never lied. He was somebody who you would go to to solve issues. And then I think, would I give him the benefit of the doubt? Hey, I'm talking over here. Shut your faces. Would I give him the benefit of the doubt? Then I say, yeah, I probably would. 
but then I'm stuck. I, I don't know where I would honestly be in that moment. So I'm looking at the mother here and I'm thinking, I, I can relate to her. But I, I also, I don't have a child, so I, I wouldn't want to hit my kid. But I don't know if locking them up would be the right thing. I, it's, it's, it's a difficult. It, it really is a, a dilemma. When he was talking about she didn't want to hit her kid over the weekend, I was talking to my sister, my oldest sister. She was on the phone with me and one of her sons said something. She goes, you're lucky that I love you and I don't smack you. And I said, do you want me to come down there and give him a wallop? <laughs> and he heard me over the phone. <laughs> I go, well, I go, would it be weird if I just volunteered? If you said, I don't, I'm not going to hit you. And I said, can I give him a couple punches to the face? Like, and she was just like, yeah, that's fine. You know, <laughs> but I'm not going to. <laughs> All right. I'm going to end this here. Looks like it'll be four parts. Um, we'll be back with part two, but until the next time, I want you right now to have a good day. Have a good night.